Hey guys, Crib and Governor from the Gut Health Gurus podcast. I've got a background in food science. My colleague next to me has got a background in psychology with an interest in the gut and the brain. And today we have one of those is rock star couples in the fermentation world. And I'm extremely excited to introduce you to Kirsten and Christopher Shockey. And, and I just want to make sure I look down at my notes just to make sure I get my, the names right. Did I pronounce that properly? Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. And, what we, and firstly, Kirsten and Christopher, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. Our pleasure. And what we, we like to do is to set the scene for our audience at the start of the podcast. And we always ask the question, mm-hmm. who is... Kirsten and Christopher Shockey. Oh. <laughs> Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> um, let's see. We, we live on a homestead and we ferment things. <laughs> <laughs> One liner. Yeah. We've been married over 30 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, four kids, two grandkids. Wow. Yeah. And, and like Kirsten said, we, we moved to this farm. It's uh with the land that my son purchased next to it, it's about 56 acres or 23 hectares, mm-hmm. uh, mostly perennials, trees, uh, orchards, things like that, pasture land. And uh, to tell you, kind of uh, give you a hint, we're, we have more kitchens in our house than bathrooms. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> So we're passionate about real food. We're passionate about the planet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and flavor. And we have a fermentation cave too, which... We have a his and hers fermentation caves, actually. Wow. And this is a really interesting dynamic because normally it's the two of us and there's only like one guest. But today, <laughs> the dynamics, it, it's, it's, we're going into new territories here because we've got we're interviewing a couple. So I'm really excited to explore that dynamic. So that's pretty cool. And so, so Kirsten, we'll start with you. So what, what's, what's your, your background in terms of, you know, your journey into fermentation? What, what were you doing before you discovered it and, and how did it all start for you? Um, well, I think my, my journey into fermentation really started with raising, raising my kids. Uh, like Christopher said, we have four of them. And um, at some point in the whole, when they were young, it occurred to me that I really wanted them to know where their food comes from and how it's grown and, and that being part of their education. And so moving out here was a big, big piece to that. And so we got goats and cows and chickens and all, and had big gardens and trees and all of those things that produce food. And then you have a lot of it and you have to figure out how to preserve it. (laughs) And so, um, I was a cheesemaker first, um, because of all the milk and yeah, it was just a very, very organic journey. And then in about 1999, my mother gave us a crock, um, that was already filled and it was in a box and it was already bubbling away. um, Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was sort of the first time we moved vegetables into the, into the scene. And honestly, for years, we just fermented sauerkraut. We didn't, it didn't occur to me or Christopher, Mm -hmm. really anybody to take it to where we've taken it now. (laughs) Just, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's, that's, it was very organic. Yeah. Great. And how about the, uh, the, the, the hubby next to you? So how did your journey start, Christopher? Was it parallel to, to Kirsten's? You know, um, so I was trained in technology. So I, I worked uh, uh, several careers, but one career in high tech with mm-hmm. Hewlett Packard. Um, and so we bought the farm while I was basically traveling five days a week or something like that. So you know, it was my role then was to try to pay for the farm. Mm. Uh, and then in 2006, I left and uh, tried to chase some dreams instead around education and farming and food and things like that. So I think that's when I really kind of kicked into playing more of an active role in this. Mm. Uh, Kirsten has the better palate. She's the better cook. 
Um, I'm happy just to eat everything that she makes. So I, I'm, I'm chief taste tester and <laughs> things like that. I, yeah. I take all the humble positions willingly in this whole thing. And the exception is uh, the latest books around hard cider and I'm the cider maker. So in that one we reversed roles and uh, she was tasting my ciders and I was making things, so. Wow, that's so exciting. Yeah. Cool. And so, so you guys, like, it, was, it, it seems that there was this interest with Kirsten's story around, I guess, your food. What, what drove that interest for you to want to explore to grow your own food and, and start a farmstead? Um, for me, uh, like I said, a lot of it was raising the kids and their health. But also in our area, we have a really dynamic um, small farm community. And as we had the, suddenly we were on the land and it, it occurred to us, wow, we should be doing something with it. And we really got interested in permaculture and biodynamics. And as Christopher mentioned, he was traveling a lot. And I think in all of that, there was a little bit of hope that you could have a very tiny farm and it could pay for the income of a family of six and we could all just mm. sort of harken back to some old kind of agrarian <laughs> economy but but I mean that is just not the reality yeah. <laughs> but I think that was in the mix and that's yeah. part of why we started that farmstead crowd business is we just we were looking for a way to um, work together and food just became a, a huge passion and partly because of the environmental implications of, of growing, you know, food right and growing it without chemicals and just mm. being part of that and, and helping people learn about that. And, and also seeing where the health of so many people is going and, you know, food is the number one thing that, that could help. I mean, we are what we eat. Yeah. Totally. And that's, that's the philosophy that we, James and I stand behind that food is just so important to get right. And, and the farming aspects, we've had Dr. Zach Bush as a previous guest. I'm not sure if you've come across his work and he, he spoke so eloquently about regenerative farming and you know, improving our farming practices, not only for our health, but for our planet. So yeah. I really applaud what both of you are doing to, to be an example that people could follow. And I guess you wrote this fantastic book called Fermented Vegetables, which is one of the most popular groups in our, our Facebook group, our Gut Health Gurus Facebook group. And we did pose to the group various questions about you, know, you guys coming on. They were all super excited to hear from you, but they did ask a lot of questions related to the book, which we'll really dig into as we progress in the podcast. So James, any questions at this point? Yeah, well, I, I was just going to ask about your general thoughts on the health implications of the way you guys eat and grow your own food. Um, what are your thoughts there? Because I think there are, at least myself, I think a lot of people would love to be able to live on a farm, eat everything natural and grow it themselves. But what have you observed in terms of health? Mm. Well, I think when we moved here, we we had our time where we were vegans and time when we were vegetarians. And then when we moved to the farm, I think, uh, I was just always hungry. I was eating a lot of <laughs> vegetarian patties, but I was just, I was just always hungry. So I think you just have to keep, um, listening to your body and figuring out what's working for you and what's not. And I know for Kristen on our fourth child, she got anemic. And so for her, iron became a really big thing. Mm. Uh, so we had to, she had to change her diet as well, you know, to, so I think our bodies change and I think we have to just listen to that. I think the biggest thing for me is not to be dogmatic about it. I mean, it's, mm. it's easy to, to get your identity tied to one of these things and that then you can't listen to your body when you say, nope, but I'm a vegan or I'm a vegetarian or I'm this, this thing or that, which is yeah. kind of where I was coming from. I had my identity tied to it. And so it was hard to say, well, maybe I need to eat a little bit of meat now. So the farm will let you at least um, raise things, know, know that if you're going to take the life of an animal, you know, to raise that animal humanely. Mm. So I think it's a real gift. Um, yeah. 
But if not, you know, finding sources of your food, local farmers, they, they need consumers that will come back every week and buy their food. You know, that it's a symbiotic relationship. There's a lot of young farmers out there who are trying to do the right thing and they just need consumers to say, I'm going to shift from the supermarket to, you know, my little farm and I'm going to buy from you every week. And that's really what they need. So I think we've got each other if we just find each other. Yeah. Now that, that, that's such an excellent point, Christopher, because I guess in, in our society, we feel that we're almost powerless and, you know, the powers that be control, you know, the, the things that we eat or maybe, you know, the, the, the pharmaceutical products that we take or the consumer goods, but the consumer is extremely powerful because you have the ability to, to shape industries with your wallet. Mm. So what you're so eloquently explaining to our audience is that if we can support these, these young farmers, these farmers out there trying to do the right thing in terms of you know, sustainability, in terms of, you know, our footprint on the planet impacting climate change, things like that, by simply making the buying decisions correctly or justly, we can really make a change. Mm. So hundred percent agree with you. And it's so brave for you guys to actually take that step because, yeah, and as Jane, James mentioned, that's, I would love to have that, that opportunity mm. And I've tried, you know, I've started out a little veggie patch in the backyard trying to grow my own vegetables <laughs> and, you know, putting in some perennials and you know, going to the farmer's market. I think we have a farmer's market once a month. So we go down there once a month to buy our stuff or go to a health food store trying to do the right thing. So what, what's some tips that you guys have for someone that's, you know, really burning inside and wanting to do the right thing in terms of our planet, our health, sustainability, what's some kind of tips that they could start with? Well, I think um, to kind of continue the thread that Christopher started, which was we were eating sort of low on the food chain as vegetarians and even vegans for a while. And we always continued that. We didn't eat loads and loads of meat, but we grew our own. Um, but with the next, with this book that's coming out next, we really explored beans and grains and, a, and especially things like tempeh and miso where we can take mm. these grains um, a step further. And, you know, a lot of what's coming out is we need fiber in our diet and we need to eat a little bit lighter on the planet. And so, I mean, we're doing the same thing. It's funny how, how we're swinging back towards eating not no meat but definitely less less of it um, mm -hmm. and you know we're really excited about about what beans and grains can do and, and so as a tip i would say exploring what local beans you you have you have availability of you know it doesn't really matter which beans find those local sources of high quality protein yeah, and, and just tracing back where your food comes from, trying to find the, the human responsible, which gets to the, the commercialization that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think eating less processed foods is always good for everybody. So trying to get more whole foods in your diet, um, you know, those can be cheaper in the long run. And it's just, it just takes longer, you know, to incorporate that. It's, we get so caught on being convenience of convenience food, mm -hmm. but really, you know, a lot of the fermented, fermented foods can save you a lot of time when you're cooking too. They're kind of a convenience, but they're a whole food convenience. So things like that. And then, you know, you can grow things like you were saying in your backyard, you can grow things in very small places. Uh, also, we work with people who are putting in gardens in cities, you know, vacant lots, anywhere where land's not being used and people getting together. So when, when neighbors combine, it's a wonderful social experiment, you know, get to see people that neighbors that you never know see because everyone's in their house and tucked away. Um, so I think that's a, a great way to know people as you're making, you know, digging in the dirt. Great. Coming together. Yeah. Is, is there any one that's a good one to start with for a novice, a good vegetable? Oh, um, let's see. It's, it's getting to be your winter. Uh, you're coming into fall now, right? Yeah, in, Into fall. 
exactly. They also root crops. <laughs> root crops. <laughs> root crops. I think, right I think the greens. Yeah. Greens are really for a novice gardener. Greens are easy. Good start. Um, tomatoes don't ferment the best, but they are a really mm -hmm. easy plant to go grow. Peppers ferment really well. Yeah. And those those can grow nicely in a pot. So if you're, you know, just have a pot, grow a couple pepper plants, and mm -hmm. in the right in the right conditions, those those are even perennial. They'll keep growing for you. Mm -hmm. Cool. I think that's a pretty, a pretty good segue to, to go into, I guess, the first part of our exploration, which is your book, Fermented Vegetables. So what, what inspired you guys to write that book? Um, I was lazy. And we're also bad drug dealers. That would be the two. <laughs> So we were at farmer's markets. We were selling our fermented vegetables. So we were in business doing that. Um, we built a commercial kitchen onto the farmhouse with the his and her fermenting caves. And uh, so we were producing them. And it, it's a hard, the next time you're at the farmer's market and you see somebody, you know, selling fermented vegetables, no, that is a hard way to make a living because you're doing all that work to make it and then you're keeping it cold and you're at the market. And sometimes people would come to it and we'd have nine or 10 varieties at one time. And sometimes they come and they, they graze and they'd say, oh my God, this is the best ever. And then they walk away and I would say, it's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> Please come back and buy them. I don't want to take them home. Yeah. And so, you know, one of those times where, we, and as we were working 12, 15 hour days, we were eating terribly, right? Because we didn't have time to eat well as we're making all this food for other people. And so our diets were going to the, and uh, so one day I just told Kirsten, and the other problem we had was that um, they can be kind of expensive, right? You know, and so you get hooked, your body starts craving them, right? So the mm -hmm. microbiome changes, and now that's what you crave. But, you know, they're $12, $10 a jar. And so we get people that would come and they'd say, oh, my God, I love your lemon dill and your perdido, and I just don't have enough money today. And so being bad drug dealers, we'd say, well, here, here's a recipe. Just go make your own. And they would look at us like, you're giving us the recipe? And I was like, you know, dude, this has been made for 4,000 years. <laughs> this isn't our recipe, you know. Well, I think the other thing really that was going on was that folks were curious. It was just the big, when we were at the market, it, it wasn't quite hip yet, but it was just the beginning of sort of that beginning moments of understanding, wow, our guts might have something to do with our health. You know, it's, it's actually hard to realize how recent that is that, that we really started getting that. Um, and so we'd have more and more people ask for classes. So we just started having classes out at the farm. And that when we did, um, well, Sandor's first book was out. Um, so the big art of fermentation wasn't out yet. And um, people were just, it wasn't enough for them. They needed more handholding because there's nothing. There's nothing about the way we've all been raised in this culture that says it's okay to leave something on your counter, and then a week or two later stick your fork in it. I mean, mm -hmm. just drummed into us to refrigerate it, refrigerate it, and so people, especially those first years, need a lot of handholding. And so part of that first book was that idea of kind of bringing them along in a way that felt safe. So I said we should write a book and get out of the business. And she said, I'm already working on a book, so you write it. And I started, <laughs> and I had a, I, I wrote about 100, word, 100 pages. I had no recipes because I didn't develop the recipes. Kirsten did. So I had stories about Captain Cook, and I had <laughs> all these segways. And I came to her and I said, baby, I got a cookbook that has no recipes. I tell what you're going to So then we started writing them. And then we ended up with like 64 recipes or 64 vegetables, lots of recipes. So that's how it began. And then we were actually self-publishing it when Story picked it up. And we added the meal section and other things to it. So it was a, quite an evolution. But it was really just trying to get out of the business and teach people how to do it for themselves so we didn't have to make it for them anymore mm -hmm. uh, yeah i mean making fermented vegetables on a commercial scale would be an absolute 
nightmare. I mean, the proper, the proper stuff. No, no shortcuts. You know, mm. a proper yeah. ferment. So well, that, I, yeah. we even had people telling us, "Wow, this is just like homemade," and it is. And I was thinking, well, because it is. <laughs> there is no machine at my house doing this for me. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's, it's yeah. We used uh, American-made ceramic crocks. They were ten gallons, so. They're over 100 pounds when they're full of sauerkraut and you know and we would have maybe 12 15 of those going on at one time so it was it was pretty intense that and it's mm -hmm. heavy food we wouldn't want to see it shipped you know to make yeah. it we, we live in such a small area to make enough to actually make a living mm. to start shipping it because we were we were selling a lot here and and doing quite well but it still wasn't an income in the same way that you know you would need and so when it came to that point of shipping it we were like let's 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 teach it and have everybody make their own so that mm -hmm. it's a local product for everyone yeah I, I love that that transition and now Kirsten I've got a burning question for you if you could go back to I guess your memory banks and that storage inside your brain to the to the point where you concocted that first recipe so <laughs> <laughs> describe the process of actually make what firstly what is it and then how did you go about developing it um well i think um so you've also got to go back in time to when the internet really only had recipes for sauerkraut that were the old school ones of shred cabbage packet layer it with salt and so i think but my first recipes were simply, let's add something to the sauerkraut. But the first time I really veered off of that was when um, a friend of mine who, was a, who grew seeds um, had all this, this winter squash because she grew seeds for a living. And that was the actual food. This organic squash was the byproduct. And, you know, she had this pile of squash and she said, what, what, can you do anything with that? And I had no idea. So I, I plugged in all kinds of search terms, you know, can fermenting squash kill you? Variations <laughs> 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 of that. And um, I didn't understand the science completely at the time that, that the microbes aren't picky. They'll, they'll, they're equal opportunity carbohydrate eaters. And so the science will work on a squash as well as a parsnip, as well as a fennel bulb or, you know, fill in the blank. And so at that time, it was, it was completely, I felt like it was really rogue for me to just try to ferment the squash. And so what I did is I tried, I, I run it through, ran it through the grater and I thought, well, chipotle pepper sounds like it would go nicely with the squash. And so I mixed it with chipotle pepper and just, you know, the colors matched and I thought it would, it would be, you know, nice and smoky. And at the same time, I, I cut some of the squash and tried squash pickles, which turned out awful. And <laughs> yeah, so I would say, I would say that's, that's sort of what happened. And then as far as recipe creation in general, I think I, um, I really like to, I, I moved around a lot as a child and ate a lot of different food. And I like that whole fusion concept of like putting things together that maybe shouldn't go together and seeing what happens. Mm. Like that's, that's a big part of my process. And sometimes it just sort of, you know, comes to me like I pluck it, pluck it out of the air. And then I think, huh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I love about the art of, of fermentation is that, you know, it's, it's such a creative process. I mean, it's so exciting to firstly be in control of your own food, but then really taking it to places that, you know, sometimes have never been done before with, with fusions or, or flavor creations or, or you know, cuisine combinations. The question I often get asked, I guess, from newbie fermenters is how do you, how do you work out the right salt ratio for the chosen vegetable that you have? Is there a rule of thumb that you work with? My rule of thumb is 1.5% um, salt by weight of the vegetable. It seems to be the sweet spot. Yep. Um, with some things like 
peppers or things that are going to be a condiment that you're, you know you're going to eat you know, less of and you need that brighter saltiness, um, of course you can take that up. Um, commercial ferments are often anywhere between three and 5%. Um, mm -hmm. It works, I think, from 0.9 to 10%, but 10% is kind of crazy for a vegetable yeah. especially. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, with playing around with it over the years, I found that that sweet spot is 1.5. You get much lower than 1.5. And so what the salt does is it hardens the cell walls on the pectin, so it keeps it the crisp. It helps control the fermentation with, um, especially when it gets warm, it, it sort of helps slow it down and that's when you would need more salt but um, so under that 1.5 percent you start getting softer ferments and and all of that and so that that seems to be where I start and sometimes I add more because I mean honestly salt is also part of the flavor <laughs> mm -hmm. and how about if the I guess you're fermenting something like a tomato that has a higher water content do you adjust the salt based on the water content? Or? Um, you know, I when something like that, it's more based on the sugar content in my mind. Oh, uh, okay. Because it's the sugar that in that tomato that's going to cause the fermentation to be so much more active, so much more quickly. Yep. And also that, that sugar, the yeasts are going to want to move in and also mm. consume that sugar and so mm -hmm. the idea is to get more lactobacillus on board before the yeasts come in and really add their funk yeah absolutely and how about something like a say a cucumber dill pickles are incredibly popular is it the same concept it's the same concept for sure but everything in a cucumber those all there's so many enzymes that want to soften it <laughs> So that's one of the few things that that's the highest salt ratio that I do. And on that one, I do go up to 5% if I want to save it. If you want to eat a quick pickle and just ferment it for a few days and, and eat it right away, then you don't need to go to that higher percent. But if you really want to say these summer pickles, I want to be able to eat in the winter, then um, that salt ratio has to be higher to keep that crisp. And then the other thing that works really well is if you know you're going to save them, just ferment them for three to four days. Just bring them to that half sour level, put them in the fridge, make sure they're completely covered in brine, and they will continue to slowly ferment in the fridge instead of bringing them to their full ferment and then putting them into the fridge. Wow, there's, there's some fantastic nuggets right there. Mm. So you, you're thinking about, I guess, the flavor elements in terms of the saltiness, then you're also balancing out the, the textural aspects, the crispness, the sogginess, the pectin setting, and then you're trying to selectively control lactobacilli and all the good acid-forming <laughs> bacteria versus yeast. So it's, it seems like it's such a balancing act to get that right. So hence so many It doesn't people, always go right. <laughs> <doesn't> always go <laughs> right. <laughs> and I guess that's why a lot of people you know, are looking for help to, mm. to get things right. But it seems like it's almost a feeling or it just comes with experience in actually working with these products over time. So what's the, the most common source of, I guess you described it as Funk or, or spoilage or off tastes mm. or, or visible growth of mold or yeast. Well, what seems to be the most common cause of that? Brian? Things above the brand line? Mm -hmm. Oxygen, just where the oxygen can get in. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's two kinds of funk because there's the funk that's like that. It's got groove. It's got groove. <laughs> it's it doesn't taste like it's just flat vinegar. Um, you know, it's that funk that you're looking for in, in your ferment, that, that little something, right? Mm. And then there's the funk where it's like funky. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's the oxygen and the yeast and, yeah. the, and the... So <laughs> we, sometimes we teach little kids how to do uh, fermentation and we dress up as superheroes. <laughs> uh, Brian, who's fermento? She's Brian, and I'm fermento, and so we're <laughs> little kids, 
And we, we don't wear like a full leotard, but we do, all, but we do have capes, like any superhero, we each have capes. And, uh, and so we tell them, uh, submerge in brine conquers evil every time. And we just try to get them and, and we explain, you know, they're like fishes and fishes like to be underneath, you know, in the water. And they're not like birds, you know, the, the birds come down. We don't want the birds. We just want the fishes. And the kids like, get it. Okay. It's like, I need to keep all this stuff where fishes would live in the brine. And I don't want them up above that brine line, you know, and they get it. And then we teach parents the same kind of thing, you know, they, <laughs> that, that works for them too. So just keeping everything submerged in the brine knocks out so many of the problems that people have, because otherwise if something pokes up, it becomes a vector for mold and, you know, then you got a whole new thing going on. But mm. otherwise, otherwise. So things that don't taste as good really yeah, thrive in the oxygen. Yeast mm. need oxygen. Yes. And, I mean, yeah. they're both fungus. Yes. So, yeah. But keeping it all under is, is huge. Yep. <laughs> First step. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love how Christopher kind of simplified that whole process to make it really accessible and easy, mm. almost like from a, a child's perspective, if the child can get it, then surely then the rest <laughs> can get it as well. So just keep it, keep it submerged, keep it under, because there's, I guess, limited amounts of oxygen when it's submerged underneath. Mm. So that's such a great tip. And the, the other common question we get asked is, I guess it's related to the book, so a lot of people go out, they buy the book, fermented vegetables, they're following the recipes to the T. How do they adjust those recipes to be suited for Australian conditions? And that's a loaded question because Australia is a massive continent with huge variations in climate and temperature right across the whole place. But what's some, you get some tips that people could deal with because that's a common question. Well, salt is a huge controller. Mm -hmm. So if you are, the nice thing about vegetable fermentation versus say um, some of the bean ferments that you know we're talking about in the next book is there's really a wide range of, of what the lactobacillus will accept and still do their job. Um, but heat is a, huge, is a huge game changer. So if yep. you're in an extra, warm climate, adding a little salt helps bring that fermentation down to a slower pace. And you might be wondering why would you want it to be a little bit slower? And the, the answer is because lactobacillus isn't just, you know, one thing that happens. There's a whole sort of succession, sort of a, a relay race, if you will, of bacteria that make this ferment happen. Mm -hmm. And if you can slow it down, each of those types will have their chance. So the first one that moves in, its whole job is to take this base, um, kind of neutral uh, environment of the vegetable and start bringing that acidity level down. And so as it brings it down, it actually kind of dies out because it makes it too acidic for its own self, but the next one moves in. And when, when it's really a fast ferment, you get a real flat, sour flavor. Whereas when you can slow that down, and sometimes, like I said, salt is a good way to do that. Also just finding, you know, a spot in the house that's a little cooler um, will help. Which is getting harder, isn't it? I mean, you guys have had some heat. Mm. The whole, I mean, I think the whole world's kind of looking at Australia in the last few summers to yeah. see, you know, what's going on. And so you know, we work with people who say it's, so much hotter than it used to be, so it affects the environment to ferment in, and it also affects, affects the plants and when they're gonna come in. So I think all of us are gonna have to learn to eat things as, as plants change, you know, because of the heat and the environment. We're gonna start eating things that maybe we weren't used to because now they grow in the heat, you know, in our environment that's changing. Yes. So, you know, just being willing to adapt to that. I think the other one is just, if you had a bad, fermentation experience when you're a kid or you know growing up forget that these this is not that canned sauerkraut that you know maybe you got in school yeah uh, so many people would come to the farmers market with their little kids and they were thinking we were selling jams or something and they they moved to the point of no return because they were too close to back out gracefully <laughs> and as the kids were just eating sauerkrauts going down the line the parents would say oh no you're not going to like that you know that's 
the pickly stuff. You're not, as the kids are just shoveling it in. And so I think just, you know, unlearning what maybe if you've had bad fermented vegetables taste like and knowing that this is a completely different, it's not a commercial canned thing that you experience and giving it a try again, you know, and then, yeah. And even if you don't like it, letting your kids, you know, unjudgmental try it too, because I mean, those little guts, the sooner they can have that kind of food, you know, the better. Those little gut microbiomes are really forming during that time, you know, and if they can have good foods, that's just, that's just wonderful. So that's an amazing advice right there. And I just want to finish off one loop before we jump onto some exploration into hard ciders because I'm fascinated to have that conversation. So just, just to, so make, make sure we get this crystal clear. If there are, if the temperature is, is higher, so we're coming into a hot spell, we, we put more salt into the ferment to slow it down. And what, what's that upper limit around 5% you think? Oh yeah. You, I don't think you need to go that high. Like I said, I'm thinking of my own recipes, which are in that 1.5%. So take, try it at 2%, you know, just 2%. take it up a little bit. 3%. Yep. Um, and then the other piece that I was going to say too, with that is, so if the recipe says, you know, 10 to 14 days, start tasting it at three days and four days, you know, really watch it. The beautiful thing of fermentation is um, that you can get into it while it's fermenting and you're not going to cause a big problem. You know, you mm. can, you can taste it as, as it's going. Um, when I'm teaching people, I say, make it in a jar so you can see what's going on and you can watch it. And as the color changes and, and all of that, you can see where it's at. And so, that would be the other thing. And especially if you really don't want to raise the salt level, because some people are concerned about that, just realize that, that that's going to be done a lot, a lot quicker. And so watch it, taste it, and just, um, you know, trust your gut. Right. I love the pun. <laughs> I think that's an amazing advice because, you know, even if you're following a recipe, because these wild fermentations are so much, at, not, not, at the mercy is a strong word, but it's so much influenced by environmental factors that that's the go-to advice that I give to people as well is taste often mm -hmm. and, and stop that fermentation when it's actually good for your palate. So I love that you resonate with that train of thought as well. Yeah. And I mean, it's like you said, there's so much that's out of your control, like what bacteria are on there, how they're going to react how much sugar is in that cabbage versus the cabbage you got three weeks ago that could be entirely different. And then the weather. So you've got, yeah. A lot <laughs> of variables. It and trusting it. Yeah, <laughs> yet, absolutely. It, it works almost every time. That, isn't that amazing? Like all those variables. And yet if we get out of its way, it yeah. just kind of works. It's mother nature, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and one little, I guess, side exploration before we move on. What's your thoughts on using starter cultures? Um, especially with vegetables, I don't see. I don't see that they're necessary because it's all it's all just right there and ready to go. But there are other things like, um, you know, miso tempeh natto um, yogurt, and on those on those places, it's really important. I know a lot of people want to use wild cultures on those and, mm -hmm. and it's fun to play around with it i mean i i do i do so too <laughs> mm -hmm. but i feel like that on um on vegetables mm -hmm. that they're all there and they're just ready to go as soon as you give them that that environment yeah. bacteria are pretty strong like the lactobacillus family we've we've done classes in very conventional places in the united states with very conventional produce and we're thinking, oh, I don't know if this is going to work, but you know, even even then, they seem to to come through. Now, with fruits and yeasts, you know, sometimes that's a difference. But I think with fermented vegetables, those those veggies should have what you need, you know. And if they don't, you probably don't want to eat the vegetable anyway. So. Exactly. And so, just to wrap up that loop, what's the the top five? recommendations for vegetables so we'll, we'll keep the fruits out of it purely vegetables for a novice to start with 
I mean, cabbage works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cabbage works. Um, carrots. Carrots are a good starter starter ferment. Um, beets are people love. Beets. People love beets. Beets can be a little challenging because they're so sugary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But cut in half with with cabbage. Um, I think uh, a pepper paste if you want to make hot sauce. Mm -hmm. Peppers are mm -hmm. peppers are a good starter. Yeah. Um, root vegetables work really nicely. Radishes, radishes, like that because yeah. they're nice and they're nice and juicy. And then onions are also wonderful mm -hmm. because they give you a whole different ferment. They're easy to ferment and mm -hmm. they stay crisp and and you don't get onion breath if you eat it fermented onion. And yeah. so it's a really nice starter ferment. And how about potatoes? Is it possible to ferment potatoes? You know, sweet potatoes ferment beautifully raw. Yes. And um, I admit that I keep thinking I need to try it and I have yet to ferment a potato. Like a, <laughs> just a white starchy potato. Yeah. Me neither. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard though that there's some people that ferment them for a day or two and then make them in the French fries. So mm -hmm. there's there's always more to be learned. <laughs> but sweet potatoes, I can I can assure you, ferment beautifully. Cool. I th people people love to experiment with that. I think. And what's the I guess a couple of very unconventional ones that people I guess might not think to ferment that you've done before. Drusel uh, artichoke. Ferments nicely. Sun, uh, sun chokes. Uh, basil and mm -hmm. you know any of the herbs. People don't think that you can ferment herbs, mm -hmm. but you can. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, because and it's wonderful all the herbs because they, you know, if you dry basil or any of these volatile compounds will go away and they don't have that same flavor. But when you ferment them and you then have that in your refrigerator off season or when you can't get to the store or whatever it, it's just like using the fresh so that's it's amazing i just thought of another question that we commonly get asked what is the i guess the time frame for fermenting is it is it a couple of days or a few weeks what's the i guess the rule of thumb aside from tasting and knowing um, it's back to that, you know, environmental issue and, you know, how, how much sugar is in it and how much, um, how much heat is on it can really change it. But I would say most ferments in, you know, say liter. A, a liter or so will take uh, anywhere from, you know, five to seven days in winter conditions, maybe a few more if your house is really chilly mm -hmm. to you know, three to seven days in summer. And, and sometimes honestly, two days, you know, it's just, it's very variable. Wow. Cause you'll read, you'll read some recipes for like sauerkraut and they'll say like six weeks mm. sometimes. And you know, that's, that's what I was going to say too. And that's the beginning of like, it's, it's done. Um, but then there's a whole range. It depends on how those ferment will keep going until all the carbohydrates have been consumed and right. then they'll die off. And so it's where in that ferment that you want to, you want to stop it. The thing is too, some of those old recipes are, were for big, you know, big crocs. And so, um, you know, when we were doing 10 gallon crocs in a controlled environment, about 60 degrees, we would have sauerkrauts that would go over a month before they're ready because it was volume and temperature, low, big volume, low temperature, longer time to ferment versus, you know, a one liter jar on your countertop in the summer is gonna go really quickly by comparison. So if you think about that, temperature and size matters. I, I hear you. The, the other thing is I think maybe there's some real purists out there that go to that end degree to develop some flavor profiles that can only be achieved with that curing process. So I guess the, the general rule is it's pretty quick, but there are, I guess, some exceptions where the, some purists are going to that extra mile to do additional steps to make it, it taste. Well, it's gonna, yeah, and it gets more and more sour as you go. 
Yeah. Mm. The big flavor change, or the, the, the biggest, most obvious one. And then the other thing is, like I said, it more and more is pre-digested for you. So it gets to the point, like if you're eating it ready, but fairly young, not as much is going to be already processed by the, the microbes. Yeah. But yep, if sorry. it's too long, then your probiotics are going away because they've done their job. They've made it acidic. There's nothing else for them to do. So they just die off. Good point. Excellent. Seawater, is that something you've tried in the past? Seawater? Seawater. I haven't. No, we're, we're a few hours, three hours from the coast. So okay. well, we've, done, we've done a lot with seaweed. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we'll, we'll get harvested seaweed, um, which we did some, instead of a kimchi, we called it a sichi. Uh, <laughs> seaweed in it. It's wonderful. It's For mommy. people that didn't want pepper. Not everybody likes spicy things. Um, turns out. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of ocean plants you can use. Absolutely. That's so uh, cool. There'd be a huge amount of umami, I think, coming through a seaweed. So it'll be yeah, absolutely sure. delicious. But I think I think from a brine perspective, what's sea sea what four percent, I think. So it's it would be a pretty salty brine. Good mm -hmm. for cucumber. I mean, and the other thing just to think about, honestly, is all the microplastics that are in the ocean now. These and, days, yeah, good point. I mean, it's sad to say, yeah, but that's, that's something you might want to think about. If someone's going to use seawater, I'd say maybe some kind of filtration piece yeah. a little bit. I mean, good point. I mean, sadly. pollution and whatnot. Yeah. So we're pretty much coming up to time, but I've, I've got to explore a little bit further, if, if you wouldn't mind, just on the hard ciders and then just then wrapping up with your new book and what's happening there. Okay. So, so Christopher, tell us about hard, what, what's hard, what is a hard cider and how do you go about, what's the basics of making it? I've never tried it before. I think it's only your country and our country that call it hard cider. So okay. <laughs> this podcast, we can say, well, hard cider is cider that's fermented, you know, to alcohol. Okay. So uh, everywhere else in the world, they're going to call it cider. So we can say we're right. And <laughs> 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 but all it is is we're taking the sugars and con con uh, converting them to alcohol, ethanol. That's what we're doing. So instead of using bacteria, we're using yeasts, but mm -hmm. the same kind of thing. So the yeast love to um, eat those sugars and go to alcohol, and we're just controlling Everybody that. loves sugar. Everybody loves sugar. True. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's what we're doing. So uh, we did... Well, oh, we've, I've got, um, in my cave, I've got 262 bottles right now and maybe a hundred gallons waiting to be bottled. So we've been doing experimentation now for a long time. Sometimes I forget the right words yeah. because by the time you've been in research all day, it's just, you can't write anymore. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I think we, I think we did maybe uh, 50, 40 different kinds, but the, the interesting thing was, so I'm a trained cider maker and you know, you're watching pH and you're watching all these things. Kirsten's not. So she was going out and capturing yeast off of this flower and inoculating this and then making everything. I'm like, you can't do that. You know, you're not using a commercial yeast. And she's like, yeast is a yeast. They're going to eat the sugar. <laughs> so we have this huge chapter uh, on wild fermentations and really beyond just what was on the apple to say, no, no, yeast come from the blossoms too. So let's capture what's blossoming right now and and do that and so i think we pushed site we even found a way to push hard cider to a different place in this That's book too. <laughs> i mean what's say for instance i'm gonna tomorrow i'm gonna start having a crack at making this wow. where do i start what, what do i need well this is great because it's the fall right so apples are on yeah absolutely <clears throat> beautiful yeah, so this is a spring here, so we've got six months to worry, think about this, but you're there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so best thing is you just need to get some, if you can get some fresh cider, someone that's just fresh pressed it, um, and it hasn't been pasteurized, yeah. then you can try to just make that with the yeast that are naturally on that juice. Basically, put it in a jug, put some kind of air gap on it, and leave it alone is the simplest possible recipe if it's very fresh juice that hasn't been sprayed because the yeast that are naturally on those apples will convert it to alcohol. 
Mostly we have to use commercial yeast because mostly the juice that you can buy at the store, at least in the States, has been pasteurized. Mm. And so those microbes are gone. Uh, you can use beer making yeast. So there's a lot of wine making yeast that you can use that imparts different flavors depending yeah. on what you want. But it's as simple as getting a packet of uh, brewing yeast, getting a jug of juice, pouring the yeast in the jug, giving it a swirl, putting a cap on it, you're done. So Probably it You'd like to say at no air? Yeah, just an airlock that has a little water gap, something. Because what you want, you want the CO2 to come out, but you don't want any ambience to come in, especially those little acetobacters, because that's what vinegar, you know, it naturally wants to go to alcohol and then vinegar. So your job as a cider maker is to stop it at the alcohol before the, vin you know, the vinegar takes place. The number one way to do that is to keep the air out. And, and uh, how long does it take to make it? Uh, if you're just doing, um, you know, like a four liter jug, um, you know, and maybe 60 degrees to 70 degrees, that could go in 10 days to the Fahrenheit. Yeah, sorry, 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That can go to um, maybe two weeks. Mm -hmm. It's going to, there's a device called a hydrometer that measures the specific gravity. Yes. And so uh, you can measure your juice beforehand and then afterwards, and that will tell you if all the sugars have turned to alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, but an apple, sweet tart apples will give you somewhere in the seven, six to eight percent alcohol range of cider. That's Australia's so got some great ciders right now. Wow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that a crack. I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna go to the farmer's market and grab myself some apples. And I'm pretty sure the apple guy also sells unpasteurized cider. Uh, so perfect. About that. So how much? Yeah. What, what's that ratio of that? Like almost like a backslop of cider do I use percentage wise? Uh, yeah. So if you're, if you're going to, if you can get fresh cider that hasn't been pasteurized, that's all you need and yeah. you're good to go. Um, and that, what I would do is put an air gap on it, a water gap on it and just let that go. And you should start seeing bubbles. So I put so, the juice as well. Do I put apple juice with it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, unpasteurized juice. If if your guy sells it and you ask him if it's unpasteurized, if it's unpasteurized, it still has all the yeasts in there and it's good to go. Oh, I'm with you now. I'm pasteurized, with you. Pasteurized. Yes. Then you're gonna have to just buy a little packet of like champagne yeast, which is gonna uh -huh. cost just a few cents, and then you put yeah. that in. Yeah, I'm with you. So you literally put in the juice with the airlock because it's got the natural yeast already in there. And so we leave yeah. that for a couple of weeks on a warm bench top. Does it have to be in a dark cupboard or in does a bench top? Not really, machine? no. Just out of direct sunlight. But, but right. otherwise, I mean, it's like the simplest recipe possible, isn't it? You bring home a jug of juice, put an air <laughs> put a fire trap on top. Wait two weeks and drink alcohol. I mean, wow. it's just... Mind blowing. Now, if it doesn't work, then those microbes aren't still there. So I would give it a few days. And if you don't see any bubbles, let's say in five or six days, then I would pitch some yeast in there, you know, so you can. And, and how, how much headspace should we leave in that bottle? Does it matter? Yeah, you, you want as little headspace as possible. Headspace. Uh, yeah. yeah, so a couple of inches is about all I would probably do. Um, and yeah, and it's just, it's brilliant to have your own. Yeah. I'm so excited. I'm going to, I'm going to give this a crack. I'm going to try yeah. this. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 all good. All good. You good? Now we're, we're going, we're going into time now. So well, I've got to finish off by, I guess, giving you the opportunities to talk about your, your new book. So you've got, is it how many books, excuse my ignorance. So you've written, this is your third book that's coming out. Yeah, in fact, we just got the advanced copy. Oh, wow. Me this so of, yeah, this is one of four in existence in the world at the moment. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. so it's miso tempeh natto and other tasty ferments. It's 400 pages, so it's fat. That's yeah. so cool. There's <laughs> some cool products there. Miso yes. making is... Yeah, and it, it follows the same the same process as all of our books, which is there's, um, let's see if I can find a picture. There's step-by-step -step where you've got, you know, just really those basic steps with the photos that go with it mm. and followed by, you know, re recipes for the ferment and then recipes of how to, 
how to use the ferment. Cool. And and that's, always been, that's always been really important to us that people eat these things, you know, and find ways to eat them. Because we have people that come up to the farmer's market and say, I'm just eating my ferment out of the jar and my husband's making fun of me. I need him to start eating it. What can I do? You know? And so having recipes that just easily incorporate it into your family's diet is really important because then it becomes simple and then you're going to start experimenting with other ones. And that's how it goes. So, so true. And I think miso, fortunately, miso and natto spores, I think we talked about it a little bit earlier. So they're pretty easy to, accessible here in Australia. Tempeh is a hard one to get a hold of. So I guess what's some some tips that you know, people buy the book? How do they source those those spores that they need? These mold spores. Well, you're so much closer to Indonesia to get the spores, you would think. <laughs> you would think it would be easier, but it Australia is a hugely, you know, it's almost like a, a fortress nation where the quarantine <laughs> is so strict to get things in. Wrong wind out of the north. <laughs> I found this this producer in Indonesia that can supply the spores to us. Mm -hmm. but he's just telling me that our, imp our import laws are just too strict for him to even consider it because I think he's tried in the past to get it just to export it from Indonesia here. Mm -hmm. But yeah, well, we'll, there's, a, we'll there's trying. a producer called Tempe Shore out of California. If coming mm -hmm. from the United States is easier. Yeah, yep. So I'll write the tempe, tea, tempe. Yeah, and then there's one, uh, Top Cultures, I think it's called, out of Belgium. Oh, okay, we'll look at those. So is it maybe, sure? I mean, not that the Indonesian isn't more authentic and you wouldn't prefer that, and it's closer, but mm -hmm. if for some reason your import laws make the US or Belgium easier, then you've got. <laughs> chance <laughs> or when, when we come to do the australian tour we'll we'll stick some in our bag <laughs> <laughs> well if you guys ever come to melbourne you know you're, you're welcome yeah, to come yeah. and spend some time with us yeah, it's an open invite and happy to show you guys around because you're, you're clearly oh, yeah. lovely, lovely beautiful people doing a great service to the rest of the world and so so the book teaches the new book teaches us how to make miso tempeh and natto and is there any, any, I guess, any, any, any challenges with making these products that a beginner might run into? Well, with um, miso, you also need to make koji. And mm -hmm. koji is growing a fungus, Aspergillus oryzae, on a substrate, which traditionally is rice. Um, so there's a whole chapter on koji and amazake and... Yeah. Uh, which can actually take you down the road of sake too, if you're interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the wonderful thing for miso is, is it's probably in Australia too, it's fairly easy to buy pre-made koji rice. Yeah. And that's the rice that, that will get the whole thing started. And if you do that, it's, it's just a great way to feel good and have a really positive result is just buy the koji, cook your beans, put them all together, you know, press them into your container and wait. Um, mm -hmm. Because the, the difference with all the ferments in this book, because you're growing um, fungus, because you're growing mold, you your parameters are much more narrow on your temperature and mm -hmm. your humidity. Mm -hmm. And so we, ha we also have a whole chapter where we talk about incubation. And I think, in my mind, as you know, we, we talk to people about this book, that's going to be their, their biggest challenge is getting their incubation system going. And once you know what works for you and how you can control either your oven or a heating pad or, you know, a sous vide, actually, water immersion circulator is my favorite, which is wow. easy. But once you can control that, then these ferments are also not very hard. But that first, that first bit of kind of grappling with what your, what your system is. And, and like I said, my favorite is a, is a water bath. And we, we show people how to make their own with, a, um, with an aquarium thermometer. Mm -hmm. So it's really cheap, but otherwise, you know, an immersion circulator like a sous vide and then you drop a pan in there 
and you put either your tempeh or your koji in there and it gives it the perfect environment. So, and what's the, the temperature, I guess, requirements for all those three ferments? So we start with, with tempeh? Tempeh is in that, um, tempeh and koji both are, are right in that uh, 80 to 95 being the top. So yeah. 88 degrees is kind of that sweet spot. Um, yeah. Miso, once you have it going, your household temperature is fine. And yep. So koji is the only tricky part of that. Yep. Uh, natto is about... 102 degrees so mm -hmm. right at what, what 40 celsius mm -hmm. and um that one is is also but it's only a 20 hour ferment so mm. it's great fast. that's it and miso can take quite a few months there's i've seen a couple of different ways to do it there's some i guess the sweeter misos which is shorter versus the traditional ones so what's the time well, frame? even the traditional ones like white miso yeah um, it's very traditional but more koji, less salt, less beans is the, the shortest ones. And then as you up the amount of beans, lessen the amount of koji and up the amount of salt, you're going into the longer and longer ferments. And so that's how you end up with this kind of rainbow of flavors. And mm -hmm. we've, got some, we've got some two and a half year old miso in the, wow. in the cave right now. So it just feels like money in the bank, you know? <laughs> it's getting better. <laughs> Aging and <laughs> like a good wine. Proud parents of these. <laughs> Have you guys ever tried fermenting with oysters? Mm. With what? With you oysters. Oysters. Oyster. Oyster. Like a garum or, or a fish paste. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've seen some, I guess, some recipes out of Europe, and even from Korea, using, like, I guess, fresh oysters. Yeah, a lot of the Korean kimchis have fresh fresh seafood or, or, or shrimp. And the nice thing that happens there is that protein starts turning into amino acid. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're gonna get these rich, deep flavors and also, you know, more nutrition. Mm -hmm. like, like a fish sauce and all these kind of umami notes. Yeah. And then a lot of what, a lot of the chefs are doing around in this country and I think in Europe too, probably in Australia as well, as they're having a lot of fun with the ancient garums, which are like the fish sauces, but now they're, you know, making them with bugs and with grasshoppers or, you know. I've never heard of that term before, gar garum. How do you spell that? Um, G-A-R-U-M. Garum. Wow. Yeah, and where's that yeah. originate from? That's um, the Romans. Oh, wow. I've got to do some research. I've never come across that. I'm fascinated at garum because you would think that all our, I guess, our ancient civilizations would have had their own form of ferments mm -hmm. going. So a Roman ferment. Wow. Yeah. That's so interesting. Besides, besides just wine. <laughs> besides just the wine and the <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a cool thing, isn't it? There's so much to talk about. You can just talk for hours about all we, could, we could talk to you for hours but we better start wrapping because we know your time is very precious and the, the final question we always ask our guests if there is one thing you could do for your gut health what would that be Kirsten and Christopher hmm. I guess my advice if there's one thing you could do for your gut is just limit the amount of processed foods that you're eating um, just cut them out as much as you can. So, you know, so that your, your gut microbiome has a chance to heal if that's what you're trying to work on mm. or find a stasis that's more healthy. So that's within all of our powers, you know, just to eat more whole foods. So that's what I would suggest. Ferments and fiber. Ferments and fiber. <laughs> I love that. That's so cool, guys. And James, <laughs> finding questions? No, I, I just think that was awesome. I'm, I'm relatively new to fermenting compared to Crippman, but this is just fascinating to really listen to two experts on fermentation. So thank you. And if people, if people want to connect with you and find you guys, what would be the best platform? Um, we're fermentworks at fermentworks on Instagram or mm -hmm. ferment.works on the, uh, on the web. Mm -hmm. But if you just want to kind of see what we're up to and more of a daily basis, I would say, um, Instagram is kind of where I put my 
my blogging energy now that people don't blog much anymore. <laughs> and then, I think also on the website, the Works, we've got a seven day free e-course that gets people going. Ooh, and just teach people, here's a recipe to do, here's what you need. Just for those people maybe have bought books, but just need a little help to get going. Yeah. And the other thing is there's a troubleshooting section on that page. We get, we get at least three, four, five questions a day from all around the world. Wow. You know, so to your point, it's like I'm in the Ukraine and I have this vegetable and I'm trying to ferment it or, you know. I'm well, most of the questions, what, how we've set it up is, you know, go ahead and scroll through and look at other people's pictures and see if it matches your picture. <laughs> but <laughs> it doesn't match anything you've already come across. It's sort of the fermentation help desk, you know, send a picture and from a picture we'll try to diagnose. And I don't know when this is being aired, but... Uh, we're having a little pre pre-order special for the book that comes Ooh. out. And for folks that pre-order, you can go to the website and put in your um, receipt number and get a link to three videos. One, just a conversation with us. One, a recipe to make your first, sort of my first miso, <laughs> really simple miso. Mm -hmm. And the other is for um, making energy energy balls, energy bites with natto, with purchased natto, because we figured while you're waiting for your book, um, you could have a couple recipes to get going and get excited. That's wonderful. Mm. I love what you guys are doing, just uh, teaching people and you know, helping the novice become more comfortable with making these wonderful traditional foods. So, Chris, yeah. Christopher, you know, Thank you so much for connecting with us. Thank you for coming onto the podcast and spreading your years and years of knowledge. And bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>